the way that I, I structured things today is really first to, to define and discuss the diagnosis of migraine, what comes with migraine, how does migraine actually affect an individual, and then to launch into what is available for treatment, and how do we decide on what to treat someone with, and how do we gauge a proper response to treatment, and, and what's even available to us in Canada. And then I also, I wanted to end with a bit of advice and tidbits, and obviously this is my own experience, but how to chat with your healthcare provider about this problem to really help you communicate your needs and to help us as healthcare providers to help you better. Because uh, all of us who, who actively treat migraine in Canada, our, our goal really is to help. So uh, if we can improve our communication, then we'll be doing an even better job. So, so what is migraine? And, you know, there's a lot of fallacies out there about what migraine is not. But what migraine is, is it's what we call a primary headache disorder. And what I mean when I say a primary headache disorder, that means the type of disorder where we can't see an identifiable cause either on laboratory testing like blood tests or imaging tests like MRI or CAT scans. And the way we make a diagnosis of migraine is based on the history that someone is able to provide us and based on the symptoms that someone is able to report. So our confidence in our ability to diagnose someone is, is reliant a little bit on, on how someone's able to communicate their symptoms to us. It is what we call an invisible disorder in that even though it presents with a ton of symptoms that can be very disabling and very, very important, it's not something that other people can see. And for that reason, it's something that often gets, gets dismissed by other people and often does not garner the attention that it deserves. And I'm always careful when I'm telling somebody that they have migraine, that, that, that I'm not telling them that they have just migraine because migraine is an important organic disorder of the brain that can lead to significant impairment and, in, and significant impairment in quality of life. And while migraine is not something that limits one's longevity, it can definitely limit um, the quality of one's life while, while they're living. And, and migraine affects people most during what we would call our peak productive years. So the people who are most affected by migraine are the people who are in their 20s to 50s, the people who need to be at work, the people who are trying to have families, the people who are up for promotions, the people who are just trying to succeed, let alone, let alone just trying to live their life and get some enjoyment out of life. So these are the people who are most affected. That's not to say that it does not occur in children. That's not to say that it does not occur in older adults, but this is the bulk of who we deal with. And it is a condition that occurs throughout the life cycle. So it may change throughout one's life cycle. And, um, and it may change in different phases of someone's life, like pregnancy, menstruation, all these other things that can also affect migraine, which I'll get into in a little bit as well. What we know about why migraine happens. So it's caused by a release of what we would call neuropeptides. So there's a bunch of chemicals that can get released in the brain, which then activate pain circuits in the brain. It's a process that we've termed neurogenic inflammation. And there's a whole lot of these specific molecules that we know are important. But the one that we've found over the last few decades is probably the most important is one called CGRP. And that becomes important based on some of the treatments that I'll discuss later on. So just kind of keep that in mind. So migraine is obviously, you know, very important and disabling and, and why we're here today. But what, what some people don't realize is that while migraine is probably the most important thing that we see in clinical practice, it's not actually the most common type of headache. The most common type of headache would be what we would call tension type headache. But by de definition, a tension type headache is usually what we would consider to be a mild or moderate or often non-disabling headache. So the mere fact is someone is asking for help and is finding that their headache is disabling enough to actually see a practitioner, the likelihood of it being migraine goes way, way up. So that's just sort of some interesting statistics. Um, I will not <laughs> I will not go through this very busy slide, but I do want to be transparent on how we make the diagnosis of migraine. And I'm not going to go through all of these details, but I, I do want to point out that, for example, if someone has had a headache that lasts for four or more hours, that is bad enough that they have to stop what they're doing. So it's moderate. And it's worse when someone moves around. And then you have some nausea associated with it. That is sufficient 
to have a diagnosis of an individual migraine attack. So it is important to kind of keep that in mind that a lot of folks may come into their doctor and not realize that what they're experiencing is migraine. And if someone does not delve, if a health care practitioner does not delve a little deep enough into what they're experiencing, they may also miss some of these cardinal things that can make uh, can make a diagnosis of migraine. So when it comes to migraine diagnosis, so we know that it's a condition that's at least partly related to genetics, probably vastly related to genetics, but we haven't all identified all of the important genes that we know are passed down that lead to migraine. However, it is a condition that while there's genetic, what we would call susceptibility, it's influenced by the environment. So it's not that the chocolate someone just ate or the weather just changed was the cause of their migraine. Migraine is a, a condition that someone has that is influenced by those external factors, making it more likely for someone to get an individual migraine attack. And as I mentioned before, the frequency or how much migraine affects someone can vary significantly throughout one's life. And for some people, there might be many years where they don't experience attacks at all, and then it may come roaring back. Um, and, and one of the more common times we see that, especially for women, is in the perimenopausal period. So it may be that someone doesn't understand, geez, why am I getting headaches now in my, in my 50s when I haven't really had one since I was 17? And, and a lot of it really is just changes in, in people's environment. And environment in the case of migraine can relate to the internal environment. So what's happening within you, other health conditions, you name it, or the external environment, triggers, foods, weather, you name it. And uh, even though these things can lead to an attack, they are not the cause of migraine. And unfortunately, when someone has migraine, they will always have migraine. It's really about how much it's active versus inactive. The way that we then further categorize migraine um, is in a couple of different ways, based on the symptoms that come with it, and then also based on its frequency, the frequency of attacks that people report. So. We, we look for something called aura, and I'll talk a little bit about what aura is, but basically what an aura is, is something that can occur, like a neurological symptom that can occur either before or during or some time association with a migraine attack. And I'll, again, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. So we categorize it as migraine with aura or migraine without aura. And then depending on how often these attacks occur, then we may either term it chronic migraine or episodic migraine. And to put it in the simplest terms, if there's something there, some kind of headache there at least 15 days in a month, so half the time or more, we call it chronic migraine. And if it's less than this, we term it episodic migraine. And, and the reason that can be important is not only for you know, proper diagnosis, but also because there are certain treatments that may have evidence or have an indication for one, but not the other. So that's why it's important to get a, a specific diagnosis, not just a diagnosis of migraine in general. But we do know that chronic migraine is the more severe form of migraine in that it affects people more, it affects people's quality of life more than episodic migraine does. And there are some risk factors that we know, like let's say someone has episodic migraine, but what puts them at risk for then going on to develop a more severe form of migraine? And some of these things are things we can modify. And some of these things are things that we cannot modify, but they're things that we may look for as healthcare providers to say, geez, if someone has all of these things, I might be more likely to offer them treatment earlier on in their course to prevent a more severe form of the disorder. So we know that if someone has four or more monthly migraine days at their baseline, that is in and of itself a risk factor for then developing more migraine down the road. We know that if people have psychiatric disorders like anxiety or depression, while those are not the cause of migraine, they can be the reason why migraine gets worse or can be the reason why migraine does not improve. So if those are also there, that might make us more likely to want to address it earlier. We know that if people are above an optimal body weight, it also puts them at a higher risk for developing chronic migraine. And of course, things we can't affect is lower level of education and being female. So really what we wanna do is like, we have to think about migraine as, as a continuum. Um, so someone who has what we call episodic migraine may fall to the left on this chart. And someone who has chronic migraine might be towards the right where there's sort of some degree of attack 
all the time or or a near daily headache or very minimal recovery between individual migraine attacks. And if we let migraine go untreated, then it can turn into the chronic form. And really what we what we hope for with proper treatment is we take we take severe impairment and we turn it into mild impairment if we're able to. And we'll talk more about a little bit about what those treatment objectives are later. So aura, which I mentioned before. So an aura is, is a neurological syndrome that occurs at some point in relationship to a migraine attack. Only about 20 to 30% of people who have migraine actually have an aura. And generally speaking, in terms of diagnosis, the, that aura should last between five and 60 minutes and occur within close proximity to a migraine attack. There is some nuance to that that's a little bit um, a little bit beyond what, what our time to discuss is today, but uh, something to keep in mind. Some people have aura, may not have aura with every single headache. So some people may have migraine with aura and, and migraine without aura in the same individual. And what we think about aura as being is it's a, it's a symptom that's represented from, um, that's caused by altered electric, electrical activity in the brain that we call cortical spreading depolarization or CSD. And this is, this is what we've learned over the past few decades, which has really allowed us to study migraine a little bit more and, and really learn about a lot more about why migraine happens and which eventually led us down the pathway of finding more treatments. So what else happens with migraine besides aura? Because there's a lot we don't talk about. The, the, the phase of when someone is in pain and having you know, a severe or moderate headache with light sensitivity and nausea, that part's a little bit easier for us to tell, but there are sort, sort of hidden phases of migraine that people won't always recognize. And I'll show you a little schematic of that in a moment. But what I think is really important to note is that there's both a prodrome and a postrome, and some people will be able to clearly identify this, and some people will not. And some people will only notice that it happens where you, you may be talking to someone about it and you'll kind of see the light bulb go off when, when you tell them about it because they think, oh, wow, I have experienced that. And why this is so important is, is I want you to think about what a migraine attack can really be. So let's say someone has one migraine a week. You know, that, that may not seem so bad on the surface, but if that pain phase that we talk about is lasting for two days, and then on either end, you have a prodrome and a postrome, that can be the better part of a work week. And what a prodrome is, is sort of a, it's a state of, being more susceptible to a severe pain attack where your brain is more hypersensitized to that. People might feel irritable. Maybe their mood is affected. Sometimes they yawn more. Sometimes they pee more. And this is the phase where someone might be susceptible to a trigger where they ordinarily would not. And this is why I sometimes have people say, you know, sometimes I can have a glass of wine and be fine. And then other times I have a glass of wine and boom, I have a migraine attack. And there is some evidence now mounting that suggests that prodrome might actually cause food cravings or may actually alter our behavior. So it might not be that that food you ate caused a migraine attack. It might be that the migraine attack caused the behavior that led to it. So it's, it's a very fascinating field of research that we're learning more and more about. And then when the sort of pain phase is over is when you have a prodrome or postrome, pardon me, and people who experience a postrome almost liken this to a hangover without the fun the night before. So this, again, can last for hours or days. So if you have hours or days on either end of that migraine attack, this could be an entire work week with one single attack. And then if you take someone with chronic migraine who's having a ton of migraine attacks, they may never fully recover. And even when they're not in a pain phase, they may be in sort of a perpetual state of either being in their prodrome or postrome or some mixture of the two. And this is why there's so much invisible disability that comes with migraine because nobody can tell when someone is, is, is experiencing these symptoms. So what we know is during a migraine attack, it's first of all, it's undertreated, it's underdiagnosed, it's not accurately diagnosed a lot of the time. And people are often left to try to deal with this on their own without appropriate education as to what they're dealing with or exactly how they can access proper treatment. And why this is so important is that almost everybody reports impairment during a migraine attack with over half of people reporting severe impairment or requiring bed rest during a migraine attack. Now, how is someone supposed to 
be at work or raise children or be successful advancing their careers if they're needing to go to bed to deal with their headache attack. So I think these are all important things to, to think about. And, and it also, we're looking more and more um, in terms of when we research migraine about what we call presenteeism, when people are at work, but they're not really at work. You know, they're physically present, but they're really not functioning to at, an, at a normal degree. And th these are things that we think about as healthcare providers too, because this is sort of, again, how, how much migraine is affecting someone's life. So unfortunately, despite, despite us knowing more and more about migraine, it does still carry an associated stigma. It's often poorly understood by people's families, people's employers, and it's often perceived as being just a headache, despite the fact that we know migraine is a disabling neurological disease. And, and it also can impact important life decisions. So if someone is dealing with really, you know, disabling or frequent migraine, they may put off family planning. They may choose not to go for a promotion that they're wanting to go ahead with. They might limit travel. They may realize, geez, whenever I go to a new time zone, I get just this god awful attack and I can't enjoy my vacation. So it, it, it may seem like not such a big deal, but if, if people are putting off things that make them otherwise happy, then that is a way that migraine causes another sort of in, in, invisible symptom. So what else occurs with migraine? Because what I haven't mentioned is how common migraine is. So migraine affects, depending on what study you read, you know, 12 to 15% of the entire population, more women than men, but, you know, an enormous amount of people in Canada are affected by migraine. And they, we like to say about one in four households has at least one member who has migraine in it. And because of that, so many other conditions can occur with migraine. And, and of course, this is a limited amount and many people have more conditions associated with migraine, but the most common, common ones we see are anxiety, depression, childhood adversity, and all of those, while none of them are the cause of migraine, all of them can influence the severity of the disease. And then what we see as well is other things that can make migraine worse are what we call medication overuse headache, which I'll talk to you a little bit later on. And then affected by sex hormones. So uh, menstruation, ovulation, menopause, pregnancy, all of these things can impact how much migraine affects somebody. So with that said, I wanna launch into a little bit about the ways in which we treat migraine. So by and large, there are two types of strategies that we think about. And some people will require one, some people will require both. Unfortunately, treatment is not curative, so there is no cure for migraine. What we really try to do is to reduce the symptom burden and try to improve function. And the two types of treatments that we have are acute treatment, which you may have heard uh, referred to as rescue treatment or abortive treatment, they all mean the same thing, or, and, or preventative treatment or preventive treatment, um, which we'll talk about the specifics of both and about what's sort of available and how to navigate uh, how to navigate both to the best of your ability. So acute treatment is really aimed at treating an individual attack. And the way that I like to say this is, what can we do to get you your day back so that you're not in bed suffering with a migraine attack? What we aim for is a reversal of pain or improvement in pain if we can't get full reversible reversal, uh, improvement with their most bothersome symptoms. So not just pain relief, but if someone has light sensitivity that is the most bothersome symptom, we also need to try to aim for that. Or if nausea is the most bothersome symptom, we also may need to try to aim for that. And I can't stress this part enough, but a return, a return to normal function. So if someone has a treatment of an individual attack, but it makes them feel like garbage, then it's probably not the right treatment for them. So we also want to see no recurrence of that migraine attack. And we also want to see something that can either produce no or minimal side effects. Doesn't that sound great? I mean, unfortunately, not every treatment is perfect. And there is a little bit of a trial and error process to find the right thing for the right person. And what we often see as being issues or barriers to acute treatment are side effects of treatment, which are common, access to treatment. So either provider, healthcare providers not knowing what is appropriate or patients not knowing what to ask or both. Uh, cost, some people don't have coverage for medications. Efficacy, not everything works for every individual. And when you have a disease as far reaching as migraine, there's an enormous amount of um, differences between people. So what worked for you know, your friend down the road who has migraine may not work at all for you. 
Um, and then, you know, some we have newer agents, so we don't have as much long-term safety data, um, which might complicate which treatment decisions we can make. And then, as I mentioned, I'll mention later, issues that come with overusing acute treatment, which, you know, a lot of people are also not educated on. So how can you, uh, how can you be aware that using something too often is causing you harm unless someone tells you? And unfortunately, it's not something that's listed on medication bottles when it should be. So what medication overuse really occurs when a medication is intent, that's intended to treat an individual attack leads to worsening headache over time. And generally speaking, we like to say that it occurs with a, a pattern of overuse that, that lasts for about three months. And different medications have different thresholds for causing medication overuse headache. So certain, like typical, to, to give you an example, um, typical over-the-counter type pain relieving medications often can lead to medication overuse with about 15 days of use per month, whereas some of the other treatments are more like 10 days a month. But there's, you know, of course, there's variance between individuals. These are these are guidelines that we use, and we don't punish people for, you know, having a bad month here and there. It really is about a pattern. And, and really, if someone is needing to, to treat an individual attack that often, that is also a symptom of a poorly treated disorder that needs more attention from a preventative standpoint, which we'll, we'll, which we'll come to later. So how do we choose? Because there's so many things to choose from. So one of the things that I look for, uh, and many and many people who treat headache look for, is what are some associated symptoms with that you have with your migraine attack? If you have nausea or vomiting very, very early in your, in your migraine attack, using an oral medication is probably not going to be the best answer, especially if you're going to bring it right back up. If the headache escalates extremely quickly, again, we might need a non-oral medication because if you think about how a medication has to become effective, someone has to swallow it, it then has to be absorbed into the stomach and then into the bloodstream to exert its effects at a, you know, at a remote target. So you know, most oral medications take many minutes or even an hour or two to really kick into their, to their optimal degree. So we might need to think about nasal sprays or injections for people who have very rapid onset attacks or people who wake up with an attack already in play. Certain medications may last longer. So if someone has a headache that typically lasts for several days, using one that has a short duration of action might not be the best answer. And relationship to menstruation. So we know that for some people who have a very, very obvious relationship to their menstruation, there may be specific differences and different types of treatments we may use in that specific indication. And, and I can't stress this part enough, but family planning, you know, the bulk of our patients are women and are people who, who may be able to become pregnant. And we want to make sure that we're doing things safely. So I always make sure that we tell everybody that if, if this is something that's in your plans to make sure that that gets communicated to your healthcare provider so we can do things safely. And then unfortunately, certain coexisting medical conditions can make it make it so that we can't use certain treatments and that we have to just be more careful if someone has a lot of other medical conditions. And of course, that becomes more and more important as people get less young. So uh, what do we have in our armamentarium in our, in our tool belt? So we have some migraine specific treatments, which we call, there's two classes of migraine specific treatments. One is called triptans. The other is called G-pants. I'll talk to you a little bit about both. Then we have non-specific treatments. These are things that were designed sort of as more non-specific pain relieving medications, but they still can be very effective for certain migraine attacks. And then something we have that we may call adjunctive treatments that, again, not necessarily developed for migraine, but can be really important. And some of those can include anti-nausea medications, which may actually be quite helpful for migraine. So this is a list of sort of what's available for uh, in our you know, in our Canadian space at the moment. I won't go through each individual one of these medications, but but I just wanted to show this to everyone because there's there's names that people may recognize. And one of the important things that I that I want to hear as a headache provider when someone comes to me is what have they tried before they come? Because I, you know, I don't want to recycle and, and go back to something that someone has found to be ineffective. So um these triptans, there are seven of them. Some of them come in oral, intranasal, injectable formulations. I will just say as just a little you know, hint of advice to everyone listening, that the word ODT means oral dissolving tablet. Unfortunately, 
because it's being absorbed in the mouth does not mean that it's being absorbed in, in the mucosa in the mouth. It still needs to be swallowed. So people who have a lot of nausea, that still may not be the best answer and something like an intranasal formulation may still be better. And then we have what we call G-pants. G-pants are interesting. If you recall, I mentioned earlier that that important chemical called CGRP, we know plays a very important role in why migraine happens. And these G-pants are things that actually have an action against CGRP. So they are essentially designer drugs aimed at treating migraine attacks. So what we have in Canada, we have one called Ubrojapant, and just very newly released, we have one called Remedjapant. This just was released in Canada last week. So a, the new kid on the block, if you will, and then some that are coming, some that are still in the United States, but have yet to be approved by Health Canada. Um, and then we have non-specific treatments. So the truth is um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs for lots of people are excellent, uh, are excellent at, at being efficacious for, for migraine. Um, the truth is, you know, someone's probably not donning my door if Advil is helping them. <laughs> so I guess I don't see that quite as commonly, but I, I make sure I put all of these on here because even if you can get it over the counter, it doesn't mean it's not a medication. So if you are you know, asking someone for help with your migraine, then it is important to make sure you document both prescription and non-medic and non-prescription uses of things that you're using so that we can help tweak your strategy better and get you feeling better. And then there are some formulations that are specific combination, um, combination therapies, specifically triptans and NSAIDs can sometimes be combined. And there's at least one in Canada now that, that comes as a single pill. So all of these may be appropriate or inappropriate for an individual, depending on the individual scenario. What things to avoid? So unfortunately, you know, these kinds of things still do get prescribed more commonly than we like. Opioid containing medications like morphine, hydromorphone, codeine, tramadol, unfortunately, all of them have very poor evidence that they can help with migraine. And in fact, more and more mounting evidence that they may be harmful for people who have migraine. And the same thing is true of, of a medication called butalbital, which luckily is not used very often in Canada any longer. So it's less of a problem here than it is in our neighbors to the South. Um, but with all that being said, and all of these things that we have to use in our armamentarium, one thing that, that I, we make sure that we try to hammer home as much as we can is when you treat a migraine attack, the best time to treat it is at the earliest possible sign. So as soon as someone can identify I'm having an exacerbation of migraine is ideally the best time to treat their headache. So that can present a bit of a problem because I've just told you that certain medications if taken too often can then lead to what we call medication overuse headaches. So how do you, how do you avoid overusing and still treating early? It can be very, very challenging for someone who has a lot of headache, but there's just a couple of things I like to point out if I can. So if someone treats early, and that agent is very effective, then you're less likely to have a recurrence within 24 hours, and you're less likely need to need to redose a medication. Because if you treat it at the optimal time, you might actually be using less medication. And if somebody waits until they're already at their peak intensity or until it's been going on for hours or days, you're more likely to need to treat on multiple subsequent days. So treating early might actually reduce your need for more medication days. So that's just one thing that I like to kind of put out there in the ether. And there is some exciting evidence that some of our newer agents, specifically the Ubrojapan that I mentioned earlier, um, might actually be helpful if people take it during their prodromal phase. So if someone can clearly identify, you know what, every time before I get a migraine, I feel foggy and I pee more and I'm yawning like crazy and I just don't feel like myself, and they've been able to identify that that always happens before a migraine attack, it might be entirely appropriate to treat early with a medicine like Ubrojapan, which is the only one that has that specific evidence for this indication. It may end up expanding to further treatments down the road, but that still is remain, remains to be seen. So with that said, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about how we treat an individual attack, but, but the truth is, you know, many providers have offered people some kind of acute treatment, but where we see people have less access or get offered less treatment is with prevention. And 
prevention is tough. And the reason it's tough is because migraine affects young people a lot who, who often don't wish to be on medication. So it's, it's sometimes a bit of a, no pun intended, a hard pill to swallow. But, but what we really aim for when we're treating someone with prevention is ideally to reduce the frequency of migraine attacks, reduce the severity of the headache, reduce the need for acute medication. So remember, Advil, Tylenol, these things are medications, even if they're available over the counter with their own risks and side effects. So being on a safe preventive medication might actually reduce someone's need for taking acute medication. And one thing that's become very, very important, and we're realizing more and more as we study migraine, is, is there's this concept called the interictal burden, which means how much does migraine affect you when you're not actually having a migraine attack? So people who say, I can't go out because I may get a migraine. I can't take a trip because I may get a migraine. How the heck am I going to give an oral presentation because the stress of it is going to give me a migraine? So we know that when a, an effective preventative medication is on board, that that burden between migraine attacks can actually also start to improve. And, and ultimately, the most important metric as to whether something is helpful is whether someone has an improved function, their day-to-day -day function. And unfortunately, again, prevention is not a cure. There's no right number of migraine days per month when we start prevention. But ultimately, we know that people don't get offered prevention often enough or, or, off, or early enough. But here are some things that we think about. So if acute treatment is being used too often, if acute treatment stops working, that might be an indication that the migraine is poorly controlled. If your migraine starts to affect your life, even when you don't have a migraine attack, that can be a reason why we need to think about starting migraine. Or, you know, to put it simply, when migraine affects someone's life, when someone is is changing their life, changing their function because of their migraine, that probably is an indication that we need to think about prevention. So because someone needs to be prevention, and this is something that I'm always that I always try to impart on upon people when I'm when I'm introducing the concept of prevention, is that it's not a life sentence. You know, some people, once we settle the fire, it may stay settled and we may be able to successfully get people off of medications. In my experience, most people generally require it for at least six to 12 months when we find an effective strategy before we try to withdraw. And, and, and ultimately, you know, migraine is something that affects people for many, 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 many years. So to have someone on something for only a few weeks is probably insufficient to really kind of settle that fire. So, so that's the reason why we do that. Um, and sometimes we can also use medications for other conditions, you know, to our advantage. So there are some overlapping treatments for anxiety, for depression, for high blood pressure, that if someone also has those problems, we may be able to kind of choose an agent that will treat more than one condition to reduce the overall pill burden. And it's, this is particularly true in older adults, where we might be able to take a long medication list and make it shorter to use things to our advantage. This is an enormous list. So again, I'm not going to go through everything, but, but I put it here to show you that a lot of what we would term our first line treatments or the things that had been around for many, many years, they weren't designed for migraine. So there are certain blood pressure medications, certain antidepressants, certain seizure medications, and other sort of oddballs um, that all of these have evidence that they can help and treat migraine. And, and sometimes if this is not presented to somebody appropriately, like, let's say I, I, I don't properly counsel someone about the diagnosis of migraine and they send them away with an antidepressant to help treat their migraine, then that may send a message that I think someone is depressed and that's why they have migraine. And, and that's not the case. The truth is we use even antidepressant medications in people who have no clinical depression because we know it has evidence for migraine. But it really is, there's no one size fits all measure for an individual person. And this really has to be a, a decision that's made together with your healthcare provider. So we have more migraine specific treatments. We have our injectable treatments. Uh, all but one of these four that I've listed are once monthly injectable treatments um, that can be highly efficacious for some people um, and are targeted again towards migraine. So these are things that affect that CGRP protein that I mentioned here earlier in the talk. And one of them 
um, is an every three month IV infusion. And then we have botulinum toxin or Botox that's delivered every three months. And again, there is specific evidence for prevention of what we call chronic migraines. So if there's a headache there more than half the time. And then there are some oral agents, uh, specifically, you know, if an injectable is something that's, you know, a little, a little scary to you, or you, you don't want to deal with how long it may stay in someone's system, um, then a medicine called a Tojapant is a daily preventative medication that again is aimed at treating that CGRP excess. Um, it's similar to the medicines that I mentioned before, but it's meant as a daily preventative. Um, and I did put another one here, Remedjapant. This has evidence, it, it does have some evidence that it can be used as a preventative. Uh, officially, by Health Canada regulations, it does not have that, that official use yet in Canada, um, but it may be coming. So it's, it's something to just be aware of. So how the heck do we choose with this massive landscape? So first of all, is there something we can use for multiple reasons? Like I mentioned before, if someone also has mild blood pressure elevation and we need to treat both, why wouldn't we use something that can treat both? That makes sense. Certain health conditions might exclude certain drugs as well as previous allergies. What treatments have been tried before? What has been someone's experience with drugs? You know, I may not choose to choose a medication that has a higher likelihood of side effects if someone has had a really tough time with medications in the past. And I hate to say it, but cost and coverage unfortunately plays more of a role than we would like it to. I don't think any of us, um, I think all of us wish that this was not a barrier, but the sad truth is this is the world that we're living in. And, and we don't want to give something that may break the bank unnecessarily. So, you know, this really is, you know, again, an individual person discussion. And luckily, because of efforts like people like Wendy and Migraine Canada, um, what has been available on public formularies and people who, who have coverage through their provincial plans has gone up significantly in the last few years. So access in Canada, I will say, like having worked with uh, colleagues across the world, access in Canada is among the best that there is. So we're, we're lucky. We're not perfect. We still have lots of room to grow, but we are lucky. Um, with what we have. And then, of course, family planning. We don't want to give somebody a medication that will be in their system for many, many, many months if if they're planning to get pregnant or they may get pregnant, you know, in a week or two. So we always ask people, you know, about their plans, not to be not to be invasive, but just to make sure we're being safe. And then, of course, there's preference and comfort. You know, someone may have a friend or a family member who's on a specific medication and that might make them more comfortable with it and us and make us more likely to use it. So when we're talking with someone, when me as a healthcare provider, when I'm speaking with somebody about how someone's doing, there's some things that I wanna know to see if this is helpful. First of all, has it been used long enough and has it been used as an adequate dose? Most of our data suggests that we won't really know if an individual medicine is effective unless it's tried for long enough at the right dose, which is annoying. You know, all of us wish we had a treatment that would work right away. Um, you know, patients and healthcare providers alike, I think all of us wish that that was, that that was the case, but the truth is we do have to give it time. And then with injectable treatments, some people, some lucky folks may have very, very quick responses. And that is reflected in, in our, in the data and the research about these drugs, but people who've had a very high burden of migraine for many, many years, we may not know their full response until they've been on it for four five, six months. So usually when we're recommending drugs like that, we do suggest that people stay on them for at least six months, unless there's an unexpected problem. And then with botulinum toxin, we usually say doing it at least three times separated by 12 weeks lets us know what the optimal response is going to be. Because some people who have had, again, have had this for 20, 30 years, it may not be till that third administration where they start to see, wow, this has really helped me. And then I think the most important is, is it worthwhile? Like, if do you want to be on this? Is it helping you enough that it's worthwhile? That That's the most important question that I ask somebody, because really what we look at as something being effective, effectiveness really is efficacy of the medication plus tolerability. So if something really helps you, but makes you feel like garbage, it's not useful. If something has no side effects, but doesn't really help you, it's not helpful. So we really have to take both of these things into account. So with all of that said, how, how does someone prepare? How does someone navigate how to prepare for an appointment, how to talk to your healthcare provider about migraine? Because, because this is a disease that has 
whose treatment is so, and diagnosis is so contingent upon communication, it is really important for us to know how you're doing. So um, if we don't know how someone's doing, it's really difficult for us to make informed decisions. So this is one of the scenarios where keeping a diary can be extremely effective. And, and honestly, it can, it shows us a visual representation of how you're doing. When I say a diary, I don't mean pages and pages of binders of things that you bring into a doctor's office because that might scare us a little bit. Um, but, you know, we want to make sure, A, we get the diagnosis right, B, how are you doing, and C, you know, what's the trend been like? And a diary can tell us all of that. And also, if they're, if someone believes they may have a component of, of, of menstruation that may affect their migraine, we can't appropriately make that diagnosis unless it's been a reliable trend on a diary. So this is where um, we have a, a resource in Canada, which we're very lucky to have. It's free. It's so easy to use. It's called the Canadian Migraine Tracker. It's an app uh, you can just download from the app store. And this is exactly how I tell my patients to track their, their, their headaches as well. It's not terribly useful to say, well, this is my you know, right-sided headache, and this is my nausea headache, and this is my headache that starts with my neck pain, because and within an individual, my different migraine attacks can feel completely different, but they can all still be migraine, and that's usually the case. So what I want to know is, how did that attack affect your function? So red, yellow, green, the stoplight system, this is exactly how you see it visualized on the Canadian migraine tracker, or severe, moderate, mild. Think about it like this. A red day, so bad you need to stop. A yellow day is bad enough that you should slow down and prioritize something, some things, but you are not functioning at a normal at a normal capacity. And mild is a nuisance. So you can still go. So stop, slow down, go. So what we sometimes see when someone actually gives us, I wish I had a <laughs> I wish I had a screenshot of what the migraine tracker actually looked like. This is just one that I kind of came up with that I drew up on my own at the end. But this tells me so much information. So right away, when I look at this calendar, I see, I see thirteen my I can see thirteen headache days. But what I see also importantly, I see four attacks. So thirteen headache days, but only four attacks. So right away, I want to know. This doesn't seem like that their acute medication is helping them enough, and we may need to actually make sure someone is treating early with an effective agent because all of these days are occurring in succession. So this shows me a wealth of information. And also, if the next month we see some of those red days turn into yellow days, some of those yellow, yellow days turn into green days, some of those green days disappear, that to me tells us that what we're doing is starting to work. So this is the kind of information that this can that, that it can be really helpful. So I know I've spoken an awful lot about medications. You know, migraine is a condition, like I mentioned, that's influenced by the environment. So we can throw all the medicine in the world at a problem like migraine, but if we don't also address lifestyle and other things that are going on in someone's life, we will only be so successful. So sleep schedules are important. So what you'll probably see as a theme here is that migraine loves routine. You take yourself out of a routine, you're more likely to get a migraine attack. So regular sleep schedule, quality of your sleep, making sure you don't have other disorders like sleep apnea that can impact migraine, diet. There is no specifically approved migraine diet that has ever been shown to be effective, but we know, you know, something like the Mediterranean diet or a high protein, relatively healthy diet generally tends to be more helpful. Um, not skipping meals, intermittent fasting is often bad for people with migraine. That's not a cardinal rule. Some people do still say it's effective, but it's a, it varies a lot. Hydration, you know, you have to be making sure you're adequately hydrated and drinking more on days that you're uh, drinking more in days that you're exercising. And we have learned recently that exercise is probably the most important uh, lifestyle feature that we have in terms of, uh, of improvement. So that can be difficult for people who have really frequent migraine, but this is where moderation is important. So on a bad day, maybe pushing yourself a touch and on a good day, reining it in a bit, a bit, because if you do everything you need to possibly do on a good day, you may pay for it for a few days afterwards. And then we have some evidence for some non-medicinal treatments like cognitive behavioral therapy uh, for pain control that may be helpful for some people, and there's evidence to suggest that it is. And mindfulness-based stress reduction strategies. Um, what, what our evidence has shown us and what our research studies have shown us is that mindfulness and the practice of mindfulness reduces the impact that migraine has on one's life. 
So even if it doesn't reduce the number of days that people have of migraine, it may reduce how it affects them. And then it's important to treat the conditions that come along with migraine. So there's no doubt that having poorly controlled migraine can start to affect mood. Um, and if we don't also address mood, once again, we will only be so successful at getting migraine appropriately treated. So it is important that all things that come with it are also addressed in kind. So, you know, for people who are just not ready for medications, and that's, that's true of lots of people, there, there are things that we can do. So what we term our nutraceutical prophylaxis. So there's some evidence for magnesium, vitamin B2, coenzyme Q10, melatonin. All of these have actual studies that suggest that they may be helpful for migraine. And then a device called the cephaly device, which can be obtained online. Uh, again, quite safe to use um, and maybe a good choice for people who, who are not so keen on medication or who have had bad experiences with medication. If you're not diagnosed or you're needing more help, you know, one of the one of the one of the important piece of advice that I'll give you is to, if you're talking about headache, don't tack it on to another visit that you're there for another reason and say, oh, by the way, it's important to try to make a visit specifically to discuss that issue so that it gets the proper attention that it needs. Um, you, you know, bring a diary to show how much migraine has affected your life. If your family, family doctor, or nurse practitioner, healthcare provider is not comfortable with your diagnosis or treatment, to advocate for a referral to someone who can help, like a local neurologist, a headache clinic, a headache nurse practitioner, all of these exist in Canada, um, in, in most provinces. So access to, to these folks is, and, and it's growing, you know, uh, our, our, our initiatives, you know, are we're trying to train more and more headache specialists uh, across the country. And if I was having this talk with you, uh, you know, when I started, you know, seven seven years ago, I would say there's there was probably only about half as many headache specialists in Canada as there is now. So we're making some grounds uh, at improving access as well.